Chai. I'm Mary Davis from the Anthropology Department at Drew University. And I'm Namita Sugandi from Hartwick College. We're both archaeologists who work in South Asia, and we're here to talk some more about Chai as part of our video blog series on the history of Chai for Archaeology Now. Yes, we've already talked about some of the most important ingredients that we associate with Chai, things like spices and milk. Today, we're going to talk about sugar, often used to sweeten Chai. Although, of course, other sweeteners can be used, and it varies according to taste and diet. That's true. Actually, I usually put honey in my chai, not sugar. Well, honey is also an extremely common sweetener, used by many societies for both culinary and medicinal purposes. Early rock art from central India depicts honey gathering, and we certainly have references to the use of honey in ancient Indian literature. But let's get back to sugar and its place in the overall story of chai. Well, I guess that makes sense if our story is really going to start to take off during the era of British colonialism. Although sugar certainly has a much longer history and prehistory than that. True, archaeologists have recovered evidence that sugar was domesticated in New Guinea as early as 8,000 years ago and began to spread across Southeast Asia and the Pacific soon after that. Starch grains recovered from the 3rd millennium BC sites like Rochdi and Farmana in India show that sugar was being used in parts of South Asia by this early time. And it's here that the story of sugar really begins to take off. That's right. We have many early historic texts from India and outside India that mention the use of sugar. For example, in his grammatical treatise, the Mahabhasya, Patanjali talks about different recipes that include sugar. And Nearchus, who was a general of Alexander the Great, also wrote about his encounter with an intoxicating drink in India that was made from sugar. From these sorts of classical records, historians know that crystallized sugar was associated with India in the Mediterranean world. Similarly, in South Asia, sugar was familiar enough that an analogy to the production process was used by the Theravada philosopher Buddha Gosha in his Discourse on Moral Consciousness. There are also various texts about the interactions between India and China over sugar, and it is believed that Buddhist monks and special envoys brought the production of sugar or refined sugar to the 6th century Tang dynasty. Because of the heavy labor costs associated with production of refined sugar, it was relatively rare and expensive and treated more like a spice or a medicine during ancient and medieval times. Even after the Arab conquest of Persia in the mid 6th century, when the Arab traders began to cultivate sugar more widely, including in the Mediterranean reasons, the yields were low and the efforts were inconsistent. It was during this time that Europeans were really introduced to sugar. Indian regions such as Bengal still produced the most and perhaps the best sugar at the time. Coastal Baluchistan in modern Pakistan was a major center for sugar production between the 4th and 9th centuries AD. South Asia dominated the global sugar industry and was synonymous with the region. It was not until the Arab rulers were ousted from Spain that sugar production began to shift away from the Indian center and the idea of sugar began to change from a spice and medicine to a commodity. Oh no, here it comes. Unfortunately, yes. With the introduction of sugar first to the Canary Islands and then to the Americas on Columbus's second voyage, sugar found a more suitable habitat than the Mediterranean. The sugar industry's high labor costs fueled the transatlantic slave trade and the plantation system. At first, sugar was used in elite households and even as a decorative element and it became associated with ritual events. Even today, sugary items and decorative elements are used as markers of special events, from birthday cakes and wedding cakes to holiday treats. Daily, it was eventually incorporated into tea drinking. Europeans were able to scale up the production of sugar and transform it into a valuable staple commodity that could be used as a cheap source of calories for even the poorest members of society, especially in the British Isles, as industrialization began. Plantation economies exploded as Europeans came to appreciate the favorable glowing climates of places like the Caribbean and South America, and the exploitation of African and indigenous slave labor. This is really when tea, sugar, and colonialism comes together to form what we think of as chai. We can think about how the forested hills of East India and Bangladesh were turned not only into tea plantations, which we will talk about in our next episode, but also into sugar plantations. In this process, many indigenous communities were displaced and dispossessed of their lands in India and Bangladesh. These people were called 
killed coolies and were used as laborers on plantations in British India and throughout the British Empire as indentured laborers. Many were actually shipped to sugarcane fields abroad, such as Mauritius, the Caribbean, and in Fiji. In fact, the demand for sugar and the need for labor to produce it once the transatlantic slavery was outlawed is what led to the formation of many early South Asian diasporic communities around the world. This brings us to the 20th century. By the early 1900s, most Indians could have formed to consume tea regularly, often adding a sweetener like sugar to make it more palatable. This is when we can really start to think of the ritual of tea drinking and the idea of chai becoming a part of everyday life. But wait, we haven't even got to the tea yet. Oh yes, that's another long history. We'll get into that in our next episode. That's right. Thanks for watching and join us next time when we explore the origins of tea and the way it all came to be incorporated into the chai that we know and love.